Welcome to week two of our journey in Romans chapter 15. And we begin as we did last week with prayer. So Father, in Jesus' name, help us to receive word and to walk in the power of it by your spirit. Amen. We're in Romans 15, verse 9. Romans 15 and verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will acknowledge you among the Gentiles, and I will praise your name or to your name. You know, this verse seems prophetic in suggesting that it is Gentiles who will end up glorifying and praising God. I mentioned last week that um, I have some Scandinavian roots, and the reality is that means I have pagan roots. Uh, I might not have known too much about it, but serving as a chaplain, uh, there actually was a small pagan group uh, that would uh, follow the Northern European way, as they called it. How I thank God that he saved my Lutheran grandparents and then used their prayers to help lead me to salvation and then brought my brother and my parents into the kingdom. Our heritage, if we went back a few hundred years, was pagan. We worshiped false little gods. And I didn't deserve salvation. Frankly, those with Christian families should be even more thankful. I know I was saved by the mercy of God. However, those blessed to be born into Christian families had prayers and faith invested in them. They too must praise God humbly for their salvation. And they must thank their Christian family for preparing their spiritual ground for them. You know, in the last uh, couple of chapels over at the Christian school I worked at, uh, they talked about God setting the table for us. Uh, it's from Psalm 23, where it says, you prepare a table before my enemies. And it's like, I am allowed to feast before my enemies. And, and what was brought out was, the best table setting God did was to send Jesus to die for our sins. God set us up for success. And oh, how I thank him for doing that. And we all ought to thank God for everything he did to bring the gospel to us. Whether we were born into a Christian family and raised from infancy in the church, or whether as happened in my case, I had grandparents praying for me, and it wasn't until my conscious childhood around the age of 10 that I made my way into a church because of church workers, and that that's how I received the gospel. Verse 10, Romans 15 and verse 10. He also says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. I love this. In Galatians, we are told that there is no longer Jew or Gentile. It's not that we deny our heritage. It's simply that God has no favorites. And we truly are one in Christ Jesus. And so there's no room for anti-Semitism in the Christian church, but neither is their favoritism. We truly are one in Jesus. Verse 11, Romans 15 and verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. We're well aware that following Christ is not a Jewish practice. We are Christians. However, neither is it primarily an American faith. Our own fellowship, the Assemblies of God, was indeed started and remains headquartered deep in the Midwestern United States, in Springfield, Missouri. 
However, our largest congregation is in Seoul, Korea. And our largest national fellowship is in Brazil with 20 million members. They have seven times more members than we do in the United States. In fact, Sao Paulo, Brazil, one city, has three million members, the same as the entire United States. Further, it is estimated that 50% of the African continent is Christian. And some of the smaller countries in the Africa boast about 90% Christian citizens. China is the world's most populous nation, and it's estimated that about 10% of Chinese people are Christian despite strong persecution. Gentiles of the world, praise the Lord. Amen. And indeed, verse 12, Romans 15 and verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse. He who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Today, Gentiles represent 99.5% of all Christians. The other half percent of Christians who are Jewish are not better or more favored. Nevertheless, we respect our heritage. Two thirds of the Bible is Old Testament. God chose the Jews to fulfill his promise to Abraham. God used the Jewish people to bring us Jesus. The Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, was Jewish. The passage we just read quotes repeatedly from Old Testament verses, the Jewish Bible. And they remind us Gentiles that God has blessed us through the Jews. You know, uh, one time when I served as a chaplain, and this was in Miami, uh, the Muslim cleric called an imam, he asked me this question. He said, why do you Christians show more favor to Jews than Muslims? Well, it's not that we necessarily do that. Remember, we are all one in Christ Jesus. God is no respecter of persons. But there is the natural reaction we have to the fact that God did use the Jews to bring us Jesus, to bring us the Old Testament, and so many of the blessings we have. We are also commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So I said, it's true that the official Jewish religion rejects Jesus completely and calls him a false prophet and, and Islam says Jesus is a true prophet, but that Christianity is false. But I said, the reality is Jesus is God the Son. So that part doesn't matter much. Whether you say Jesus is a true prophet or a false prophet, if you deny the deity of Christ, you're no better in the eyes of God. And, and so it's not that we favor the Jews, but we respect our heritage. And the reality is, God chose to bring Jesus through that line, through the Jewish people. So there is a natural respect that we have. Verse 13, Romans 15 and 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, hope is sometimes presented as a weak version of faith or as a very weak version of love. We all know that verse. Now these three remain, hope, faith, and love, but the greatest of these is love. But it, that verse is not meant as a rank order. How can this be if our God is a God of hope? It may be better to say that hope is an important seed from which the fruit of faith and love often come. The reality is 
hopeless people are unlikely to receive or follow the good news. After all, God is a God of hope. Joy is also underrated, particularly in the Christian world. You know, people will say, well, how can you be so happy when people are dying and going to hell and there's so much misery in the world? Some people think they're better Christians because they're joyless. Look, suffering may produce faith. God will bring it when we need it. But we're never commanded to go looking for suffering. On the other hand, joyless Christians stifle the hope of seekers. We ought to be attractive, and we become attractive when we are joy-filled. Trust me when I say this. I work with young people day in and day out. They're looking for teachers who have joy. If, they, if their teachers are miserable or downcast or, or look heavy and tired, that causes them to be hopeless. They want to see people who are relaxed, who have the joy of the Lord in them. They're looking for upbeat people, and they need that example. And indeed, even amongst adults, seekers who might turn to God need to see joy in us. If we look miserable, they will have no desire to follow in our footsteps. Finally, there is that powerful characteristic of peace. You know, I got praised by a student once, and I, I, I think I, when I heard it, it, it hit my ears in a good way, and I, I really liked what I heard. The student said that I was one of the calmest teachers he had. And I thought about it and realized very quickly what a powerful compliment that was. I remember a few years back, uh, I was good friends with one of the psychologists at the jail. And I asked, I said, if I had to summarize what it is that you do, what it is that you try to bring to your clients, I would use the word peace. I would think that what you desire for your client is that they end up being in a place of peace. And he looked at me and smiled and he said, that's a fantastic summary of what we would hope to bring is peace. And so if you think about that, people are on the outside of jails paying sometimes two, $300 an hour to have a conversation with a professional and what they are seeking, not at the end of one session, but hopefully at the end of what may be months and months of sessions is eventually they hope to arrive at a place of peace. Consider too that Islam, which is a false religion, it does not lead people to Christ, but how do they advertise themselves? They say they're a religion of peace. We should be better at it because Jesus brings us perfect peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And so we Christian people ought to be bearers of peace. And if we are not, if we find that we are not peaceful people, if we see that in our lives there is chaos, there is struggle, and we don't walk in peace, then perhaps we need to spend time with the Lord and say, God, help me to find my place of peace in you. Verse 14, Romans chapter 15 and verse 14. Now I myself am persuaded concerning you, my brothers, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and also able to instruct one another. You know, we tend to focus on correction, but let's take a moment and respect the Roman church for its goodness, its Bible knowledge, and for their ability to disciple one another. Frankly, this is a successful church by most accounts. What church does not want to be known for the goodness of its people? 
We pastors constantly preach that non-Christians should respect us and be jealous of our goodness. For that to happen, we must be good. For the sake of the good news. Also, what church does not want to be known for its faithfulness to the Bible? And isn't it awesome that this church practices strong discipleship, training members to grow in Christ? One of the criticisms lodged against the seeker-sensitive approach to church is that it often overlooks discipleship in favor of evangelism, as if these two things were in conflict, which of course they should not be. Well, this church got it right. Rome got it right. Nevertheless, the Apostle Paul does have a problem with it. Verses 15 and 16, Romans chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. Nevertheless, brothers, I have written even more boldly to you on some points to remind you because of the grace that is given to me from God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. First, Paul seems to defend his ministry. He insists that God's grace has allowed him to be a minister, especially to the Gentiles. He also invokes the Holy Spirit, seeming to urge the Roman church to embrace Gentile believers. We Americans know about discrimination. We hate it, but we find that we often must fight against it. Paul says to fight this good fight. There is no room for favoritism nor for prejudice in Christ's church. And so here's what we've said today. Paul reminds us that our faith is international because God is no respecter of persons. Gentiles and Jews have equal opportunities in God's kingdom. And there is no room for prejudice or discrimination. At the same time, we do respect the Roman church for its goodness, its Bible-centeredness, and for its discipleship. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that we will embrace those good things from the Roman church and Lord, that we will abandon anything that hinders or keeps the gospel from going forward. Especially, oh God, search our hearts. If there be any prejudice within us or within our fellowship, I pray that we'll see it clearly. We will rebuke it in the name of Jesus and we will flee from any temptation to favoritism or prejudice. Our desire, God, especially in this wonderful community you've granted us to be a part of, this very international community, that we truly will be one in Jesus Christ. We give you all praise, and we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen.